Welcome, friends. This is our Wednesday night meditation and talk. It's live streaming on Facebook and YouTube and IMCW's uh, pages as well. So we begin with a meditation, and this is one that I've selected from the archives. I hope you enjoy. you do that, sense that you're breathing in and out of your heart. Become aware of your heart, what we might call the state of your heart. Just whatever you feel in the heart area. and with a kind of listening attention. Listen for what your deepest intention is in practicing meditation right now. What is it your heart longs for? What matters? In the stillness, you might scan through your body and notice if there's any areas of particular tightness or tension. And sense what might want to let go a little right now. You might want to soften and smooth the brow, let the eyes be soft, and the jaws unhinged, and sense the tongue filling the lower palate, maybe a slight smile at the mouth. You might allow the shoulders to fall away from the neck. Just sense from the inside out, the shoulders, whatever you feel in terms of tightness or tension, and see if you can let it float a bit in awareness, naturally untangle and loosen. softening the hands and softening again feeling the hands from the inside out the tingling and vibrating there and let the chest be open and scanning down the torso let this next breath to be received in a softening belly. This breath. And now this one. And again. Waking up from the inside out in this living body feeling the touch points where your hands contact each other, or your legs, or your bottom is on the cushion or chair, and the feet on the floor. And then feeling from the inside out this whole body all at once, this energy body, this living field of sensation. And 
and discover in this changing dance of sensations the simple movement of the breath not controlling in any way just discover the sensations of the breath the inflow and outflow feeling this whole body breathing and yet resting the attention wherever the breath is most predominant perhaps the inflow, outflow at the nostrils or maybe the rising, falling at the chest or the belly and maybe you feel the whole body breathing even in a cellular way like a balloon inflating and deflating there are many places in meditation we can rest our attention and the breath is perhaps the most common a kind of home base sense that you're receiving the breath as if you could listen to it and feel it at the same time knowing the breath is coming in with the in-breath and knowing the breath is flowing out with the out-breath notice how much you can relax with the inflow as if you're relaxing, open to receive and relax with the outflow letting go if you find it hard to find the breath you can gently place your hand on your belly and just feel the movement of the breath by feeling the movement of the belly expanding, deflating at some point there'll be a noticing that there's no longer an attention at the breath the mind has moved to some commentary, some planning some visualizing some virtual reality and the practice is to appreciate when there's that waking up and noticing and to simply relax, open the mind again perhaps noticing the sounds that are right here in the room instead of the sounds in the mind and perhaps relaxing a little in the body and gently shepherding the attention back to the next in-breath or out-breath rising breath or falling breath or 
Again, relaxing with this home base. Noticing the difference between the presence that's right here and being inside any virtual reality, any thought bubble. It's totally natural for the attention to wander. And what's important to know is that every time we notice it and gently arrive again right here with these sounds and these sensations and this breath, we're deepening the pathway home. We're increasing our capacity to arrive in presence. So no judgments about leaving. Each time is an opportunity to practice coming back, right here, right now. Noticing where your attention is. And if the mind has drifted, again, letting it be an opportunity for homecoming, listening, re-relaxing a bit, perhaps the shoulders can let go a little. Let the hands be soft and relax your heart. And then again, sense the movement of the breath and rest with the inflow and outflow of the breath as a raft might rest in the sea. Breath by breath. And for these last few minutes, letting go of the breath as an anchor or home base and simply allowing whatever arises to be here. Aware of the changing sounds, feelings, and letting life be just as it is
And we close in a simple way with loving kindness from your own awake awareness offering whatever wish you'd like to right now to the life within you whatever wish or blessing or prayer resonates and feeling that boundless heart space that boundless and loving awareness that's our source and feeling the earth, our mother, in our laps and all beings everywhere offering your prayer, your care to this living world This is a good time to mindfully stand or stretch if you'd like. And as you do, I'll make a few announcements uh, for this week. Uh, Please check my website, tarabrock.com, for all virtual offerings. And I hope you'll be able to join us for the satsang we have, this gathering uh, with questions, answers, uh, chance to meditate together on Saturday, uh, the 17th. Also, please check imcw.org for live stream offerings made available by our local DC teachers. And the affinity groups coming up this week are women, young adults, heart with, and teens of color. As many of you know, the teachings are offered freely. Your donations make a huge difference. We ask $10 if you can afford it. If you can't, totally fine. If you can pay more, that really makes a difference. So thank you. Uh, Links are found in the description. Okay, we're going to have a short pause and then begin a talk that I gave a couple of days ago at our IMCW spring retreat. So I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Welcome back, friends. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I wanted to start by honoring you. Um, Just really the quality of effort and earnestness and, and dedication to practice. I feel like we're all kind of helping each other along and the atmosphere is just, uh, it's sweet and beautiful. So So I wanted to start with a quote. This is uh, Thomas Merton, who once said, of what avail is it if we can travel to the moon, if we cannot cross the abyss that separates us from ourselves? This is the most important of all journeys, and without it, all the rest are useless. I'm starting with this because... It feels like that's what we're doing, um, that we gather here. And in a sense, we're crossing the abyss. There's so much conditioning to cut us off from ourselves and cut us off from each other. And we're in this practice that is really um, bringing an intimacy with the life that's here. And you could feel that as Jonathan spoke yesterday, this it's such a powerful talk on meeting difficulty, all those challenging weather systems befriending, you know, with the wings of mindfulness and kindness. And then the beautiful metta meditations yesterday with Devin and then just now with, with La that really keep inviting us uh, into this heart space, into really embracing ourselves and naturally finding how it extends outward. So I had a yoga teacher long, long, long time ago, 
And she taught this in slightly a different way than we're doing here. She, and these are the instructions she'd give. She'd say, put your left arm over your right and hug yourself. And then she said, put your right arm over your left and hug your evil twin. <laughs> And I had no idea what was coming. I was following the instructions, but then I realized, why not? You know, just embrace all parts of ourselves, whatever we consider them, whatever we consider them to be. And yet we know that when the difficult weather comes along, and you can kind of track how it's been these last days, it's not our first response. It just isn't. You know, our first response is to either ignore it or think it's in the way of our of the real meditation. <laughs> I try to get rid of it. Um, and the most painful is really judging ourselves for it. Um, this shouldn't be happening. This is a sign of something bad about me. It's my fault. I was thinking of just today, uh, my last group of the morning, we had all of us had trouble getting in the room because the link uh, didn't work. But each of us were just sharing on how quickly our minds defaulted into, this is about me, it's my failure. <laughs> you know, It just what happens. And um, many of you are probably familiar with the Buddha talking about this in terms of getting shot by two arrows. And I find it so useful to remember this because the first arrow is the painful emotion. Let's say anxiety comes up you know, something's going wrong, I'm going to miss something. And then we shoot a second arrow, because we're disliking our insecure, anxious, failing self. So we're blaming ourselves for the experience. And here's the thing. When we're doing a lot of second arrowing, in other words, when it's a habit of judging ourselves, we're creating an abyss that really locks us in suffering. It solidifies our identity as a bad self, that, that undercurrent that nags away, something's wrong with me. And the reality is that any degree of self-aversion, any self-aversion in the moment is creating an abyss that distances us from others and it actually obscures reality. It obscures reality. So the focus of this talk is, as you might be detecting, uh, I, I think of it as loving ourselves into healing. And it's a really continuation of what you've been exploring with the different teachers thus far. Loving ourselves into healing, into freedom. And I often think, you know, if, if this was the last talk I was ever gonna give, you know, what would I talk about? And I would talk about love. I would talk about love because in the deepest way, it's what we are and it's what we're coming home to. You might consider it loving awareness. There's all these different words. So I find it helpful to consider, if I just think kind of more in terms of the lifespan, that what you as an infant or young child most needed and what I needed and what we all need if it really came down to it, is to feel understood, like others were getting us, they, they understood us, and that what was seen was loved, that we're loved. And there's a evolutionary psychologist, Cozzolino, who says it's not the survival of the fittest, it's the survival of the nurtured. And so this is what we're practicing, really. Um, learning to offer to our inner experience, this nurturing. And when I wrote Radical Acceptance, I termed it as spiritual reparenting because it's really, when you think of what is meditation doing, we're recognizing what's arising, we're coming to understand, here's what the experience is, and we're holding it with kindness. So this is what actually undoes the identity of bad self this over and over again, seeing what's here and relating with kindness. It's what reconnects us with our basic goodness. So the starting place is 
really becoming aware of the thoughts and feelings of bad self. Sometimes they're subtle, sometimes they're really overt. And um, well, maybe for a moment, if you're not already on gallery view, switch to gallery view if you don't mind. Okay, you hear? So the, the question I have really is, how many of you feel like you're aware of judging yourself too much and really the pain it causes in your life? And, and you can do it by hand raise your arm or else just putting it up and take a moment just to look at the kind of screen through. And it may not be everybody, but we're, we're getting it that there's just a lot of us that know how deep a habit this is for us. So thank you. Um, whenever I do stuff like this, <laughs> please know it's really optional. And I'm sorry I didn't say that. Decades ago, again, this is rad when I, when I um, wrote Radical Acceptance, I, I described this as a trance of unworthiness because most of us are aware that we are um, judging a lot and it causes pain. But as we move through the day, we're not conscious of how many moments there's this undercurrent of something's wrong, that I'm falling short in some way and how it impacts everything. So that when we're with other people on some level, we're monitoring to see how they're responding to us because we're afraid of being judged and rejected. I remember doing a course on fear and I had people get into small groups and write on a piece of paper their greatest fears and then we shuffled them around and read them out. Most of the fears had to do with the fear of others' judgment. This trance of unworthiness affects how we approach work because we're so anxious about mistakes that we can't be as creative as we want to be. It, it affects meditation. We so often feel like we're falling short. It's, it's really important to notice how much the trance of unworthiness totally bleeds into the spiritual path, this idea of how we should be speaking, acting, feeling. I mean, on some level, we're always monitoring ourselves and seeing if we're meeting a standard that's our perfectionistic standard. And there can often be a background sinking feeling of falling short. Um, I saw a cartoon with a, a woman, uh, she was having kind of an entry meeting with God in the afterlife. And he's shaking his head and saying, nope, that's not a sin. Uh-uh, no, not that one either. No, no, that's not a sin. He goes, my goodness, you must have worried yourself to death. <laughs> and I liked it because I'm so, I'm interested in the word worry. The old English for worry is strangle. And when we're judging ourselves, when we have that anxiety about imperfection, it's just this strangling. And so many people report like, I want to inhabit my full vibrancy. And yet, as long as there's that patterning of uh, judging, it's very hard to feel fully alive. So people often ask me, you know, why do so many of us struggle with this? It's, it, when I was doing book tour for Radical Acceptance, that was the biggest question. How come so many of us are, and they didn't put it this way, but going around strangling ourselves, you know? And um, our sense of value and our sense of belonging, and they go together, <laughs> they go together, um, is shaped by our caregivers and our society. You know, how well do others see us? Like really see who we are, mirror, who we are, and how unconditionally are, do they love us? You know, and it's, it's the caregivers and society. One man wrote about it, the kind of messaging growing up in his particular religious community. He said, they taught me two things. One is that God loves you and you're going to burn in hell. And the other is that sex is the most awful, filthy thing on earth, and you should save it for someone you love. <laughs> now, so, <laughs> so maybe we didn't receive this much of a mixed message, but each of us were given messages about how others viewed us, including how we should be different, where we're falling short. 
maybe to pause right here and invite you to reflect for a moment. You can just explore this for yourself. If Let your attention go inward. If it helps to have your eyes downcast or closed, go ahead. And imagine yourself at around eight years old and you're in a room that you might have commonly been in with whoever were your primary caregivers. So just imagine that. Might be a dining room, might be in a TV room, kitchen. And they're looking at you. And just notice face, eyes, expression. I'm sensing how they're viewing you, what they're focused on about you. And you might just wonder what brings approval or love from them? What about me? What about me brings disapproval and our distance or rejection? What's the degree of belonging that you feel, of truly being understood and loved? You can continue to reflect if you want to journal at any point to just write something down, because we're going to do a few reflections that really have to do with waking up out of the prism, really, of a small self that in some way might be falling short. So many of us had parents or caregivers who due to their own fears, their own beliefs, wounds, their self-focus, their trauma, their generational trauma, they weren't able to see and understand us, to love us unconditionally. And some neglected and abused us, it's all to varying degrees. But the upshot is many of us got the message that there's something wrong with us, that we need to change to be okay. And here's what's important. The caregivers are shaped by society. So even when they're more awake than the society, our society has great power to turn us against ourselves. I'd like to read you something. This is written by a mom. It was in the Sun magazine. Am I gorgeous, my child asks, drawing the word out like pulled taffy? Yes, I say you are. Pink and teal dress is probably made of highly flammable material, some chemist's approximation of satin, pudgy fingers decorated with pink polish, trace the sequins on the bodice. I love this. A giant pair of bubblegum pink wings flap slowly. Little feet dance in sparkly red slippers. I'm just like a real princess. Yes, I say, you are. Thick blonde hair, blue eyes, rosy cheeks, flawless skin. This child is the American epitome of beauty. This child, my son, he's four years old and prefers to wear dresses. Maybe it is a phase, maybe not. Even as I wonder how I produce such an angelic looking creature, I wish he would put on some pants and go back to playing with toy tractors, not because it matters to me, it doesn't, but because I'm already hearing in my head the name calling he will face in kindergarten. Many adults already seem a bit disturbed by the dresses. Strangers utter awkward apologies when they realize he's not female. This culture wants little boys to dream only of baseball trucks and trains. This culture has no room for little boys who want to be gorgeous. He picks up a parasol a neighbor gave him and opens it jauntily over his shoulder. Am I beautiful, he asks. I sweep him into my arms and plant a kiss on his cheek. Always. So 
So what happens in this society when it doesn't have room for us? You know, our societies are caste systems. They're most notably racial caste systems, also demean and violate us because of gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, and on and on. What happens when the daily message is you're inferior, you don't belong, something's wrong with you? And, and while society actively targets and violates some, it divides all of us from each other. In other words, it prevents all of us from true belonging. So I'm speaking this way because the need for belonging is in our human DNA. It's a fundamental survival need. It's essential for our continued evolving. And when belonging is severed, and that's what we're talking about, it brings up huge fear, huge insecurity. And then with that, all these behaviors, because when we feel so insecure, severed belonging leads us to behaviors to self-soothe, to find some ease to protect. And, and, and so that's over-consuming, medicating, you know, using anger, defensiveness. One woman with a, a lifelong eating disorder had been terribly emotionally abused by her mother, really continuously demeaned, shamed. And she describes about her eating disorder, the kind of uh, beginning, she describes a, a bedtime ritual. And I want to read this to you. She says, from the age of five or six until I was well into my teens, whenever I had trouble sleeping, I would slip out from under my covers and steal into the kitchen for a bit of bread or cheese, which I would carry back to bed with me. There I'd pretend my hands belonged to someone else, a comforting, reassuring being without a name, an angel perhaps. The right hand would feed me little bits of cheese or bread as the left hand stroked my cheeks and hair. My eyes closed. I could whisper softly to myself, there, there, go to sleep. You're safe now. Everything will be all right. I love you. The self-soothing was a primitive way of her loving herself. And yet it became uh, the enemy. It, it fed into self-hatred. And I, I bring up this example to you all because it's the first, uh, first way we can start controlling things is with food. So, so many hate themselves for food and for bodies that they feel are the wrong size. And it was like our, it's our primitive nervous system trying to feel better. And this happens in many, many ways. So many of the ways that we try to feel better, we hate ourselves for. And so part of waking up from the trance of unworthiness, this is what's important, is to recognize that what we're hating is our best effort at loving ourselves. It happened in an early time and we locked in. But we need to be able to see that what seems most destructive on some level is an effort to cope. So what happens is instead of seeing that, we have a lot of self-distrust, a lot of self-aversion, and it shows up daily, you know, continuously anxious about what others think and having these standards I've been talking about and feeling like we're making mistakes or falling short. You know, I can see it in myself, that that kind of chronic monitoring. Um, I can, if I paused and slowed down right now as I'm speaking, there is some part of me that's saying, well, how am I doing now? You know, am I authentic? Am I here? Am I embodied? Are we in a resonance field? You know, it's like there is that monitoring. And so often there's a sense of, oh, not fully here. Um, a sinking feeling. It, it helps to name that out loud. I'm just saying right now on the spot, when I can name out loud that the monitoring is going on, then I'm not so identified with it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> 
so this is part of trance that we get divided against ourselves and um, it can come up as fear as doubt version sometimes subtle sometimes dramatic either way what happens is it's like clouds that obscure the sun we can't see who we are so again pause to reflect take a moment let your attention turn inward and i'd like to invite you to just scan and sense how you've been relating to yourself during this retreat scan and notice anywhere you might have been holding on to the judgment of i should be different doing it differently feeling different having different kinds of thoughts less thoughts maybe there's a judgment about how you've been in relationship with those in your where you're living if there's others around Maybe you had a teacher's meeting and you didn't feel like you really expressed who you were. Is there judgment for sleepiness? For ways you've been eating? Or for maybe something you carried into retreat with you, something that's hard to forgive you carried in with you? Real gentle, real gentle. You can bring up a lot of sadness, a lot of pain, sometimes despair, just to sense how thick it is. We're in it together. Sense yourself witnessing. Yeah, breathe, breathe and witness. Just naming it, okay, judging, self-aversion. This is the trance. And with that, you might just sense your deep intention towards spiritual reparenting. Really, it's towards trusting your basic goodness. You know, the most basic truths are the ones we regularly forget. And one of those truths is, if our hearts are closed against ourselves, that closed heart is not going to be able to really love life. We need to cross the abyss. There's a a teaching from one of my teachers, Sri Narsargadatta, who's a non-dual Indian master, no longer alive. And... I want to read it to you and then uh, unpack it a little. Here's what he says. All you need is already within you. Only you must approach yourself with reverence and love. Self-condemnation and self-distrust are grievous errors. Your constant flight from pain and search for pleasure is a sign of love you bear for yourself. All I plead with you is this, make love of yourself perfect. Deny yourself nothing, give yourself infinity and eternity and discover you do not need them, you are beyond. All I plead with you is this, make love of yourself perfect. So the words, Your flight from pain and search for pleasure is love you bear for yourself. And this is what we're looking at before. It says that the grasping, the aversion, like that woman's eating disorder, are coming from love, that this organism is trying to live fully. It's misguided love. It's coming from an illusion of separation. It's what I sometimes call a false refuge that causes suffering. But it's coming from love. So here we are, the, the plea is this, make love of yourself perfect. So what is yourself? Many people ask this, they say, well, you know, here we are and Buddhism says there's no self, why are we trying to love this self? So let's say you're angry. You're not loving the narrative self. In other words, the story of a person who's righteous or who just lashed out. 
what you're doing is you're loving the life in this moment that's expressing through you, whether it's the heat of anger or the tightness of the heart. So you're loving the aliveness that's expressing in the moment, not the story of a self. I hope that's helpful to you. What does it mean to say make love perfect? And that is really talking about dedication. That when we realize what the trance of unworthiness does, that it keeps us in a prison of bad self, then it becomes the center of our path, a deep, deep commitment to love ourself into healing. Then he says, give yourself infinity and eternity and discover you do not need them. You are beyond. That if you love yourself without holding back, true, unconditional love, letting it in, it dissolves that sense of a limited, separate self. It reveals the reality, which is really a boundless field of tenderness, of wakefulness. It reveals our wholeness. So, it takes intentionality. This is one of the main things I really want to convey, that the trance is sticky, it's persistent. And so what I'd like to do is, is look at, um, look at really the, the challenges that we run into when we're trying to make love of ourself perfect, uh, the challenges people run into with the metta practice or self-compassion or the end of rain, the nurturing of rain. And often I'll ask people, well, what stops you? And I'm asking, you can sense this for yourself right now. What stops you? from accepting yourself just as you are? You know, what stops you from bringing kindness to the places you've been reacting to? What stops you? For many, and I'll share what I hear often, is it's the fear that if I don't judge myself, I'll never be the person I want to be. In fact, I'll get worse. <laughs> no? Let me just check with you. How many can relate to that? If I stop judging, I'll never improve. Can I just see by hands? Yeah, I mean, I see that in myself. It's what dry, it keeps driving the effort. Yeah, so the truth is, I have never seen someone judge themselves into spiritual transformation, into who they want to be. And I've never found someone who dedicated to true self-kindness not find increasing freedom. Never seen that. So let's, let's, let's look more closely because you have to, the only way you'll discover it is if you do it, at the challenges. And the most regular challenge, uh, you know, we, we offer metta, we, we invite you to really experiment. And metta is not just, I mean, there's one classical form where you're repeating several phrases over and over, but as you've been sensing with uh, Devon and with La, there's many different facets you can experiment with. And one is touch. You can touch your hands on your heart or, or a hug. Um, images, using imagery, you can uh, practice any words you want. You can imagine offering yourself love or you can invoke a love or trusted being. It could be a non-human being, could be your ancestors, could be anybody, any other source. But many people, when they start exper experimenting, still feel blocked and they feel in some way hypocritical or fake, or they're going through the motions, or even worse, that just the practice of loving kindness, they actually bring up more of a sense of unworthiness. And I won't do a hand raise on this, but I know how, how common that is, that the very idea of offering love to ourselves, we feel incredibly undeserving of it. One friend of mine, a um, fellow Dharma teacher and, and buddy, uh, Shauna Shapiro, describes her pathway to metta. She was going through a a difficult divorce and she would wake up each morning in this kind of pit of shame and failure. And her meditation teacher said, well, how about saying to yourself each morning, I love you, Shauna. Just, you know, 
I love you, Shauna. And Shauna said, no way, <laughs> you know, that, like, it, I, it's too far from what I'm feeling. And then the meditation teacher said, well, how about instead just put your hand in your heart and say, good morning, Shauna. She said, I could probably do that. <laughs> so she practiced really regularly. And a few months later, teacher said, okay, you're ready to graduate to the advanced practice. Now it's, you know, good morning. I love you, Shauna. She did it the next morning. She didn't, it wasn't terrible. She didn't feel any love, but she just did it. And she kept it up. And one morning she put her hand on her heart and did it. And she felt her grandmother and her grandmother's grandmother and the whole lineage of, of women, her own mother, just surrounding her and infusing her with loving. And I share this because you don't have to feel it all very strongly, but what you do need to do is just plain practice. <laughs> Go through the motions and do it regularly because our neuro you know, our neural pathways actually gradually wake up the more we run the same experience through. And what you practice grows stronger. That's what it comes down to. And you can be gradual. You can feel a vulnerable part of you and just send the message, I'm here, I'm listening. You don't have to start with love. You can just, or you can go, I care about the suffering. Or you can just put your hand on your heart and breathe. Experiment at what minimally is the entry. But here's why it works. Because if your intention is to bring love to the life that's here, if that's your intention, that intention is coming from love and it helps open the door. That's why going through the motions help. All you need is somewhere deep down to want to bring more love to your own being. Okay, so that's the first piece is uh, practice makes whatever you practice get stronger. And as long as there's a sincere intent, it's okay to go through the motions and keep experimenting how you do it. Now I wanna name a second challenge. And that is that whether we're offering care to ourselves or we're receiving it from a source we have in mind, um, the inner place of vulnerability can have trouble letting in love, letting in love. And I remember about 12 years ago, Harville Hendricks and Helen Hunt, some of you know Harville Hendricks, marriage therapist, best selling author and so on, on relationship. Well, they were going, you know, they trained couples and so on their relationship was crumbling. And it turned out that Harville could not believe that Helen loved him. He couldn't let in love. You know, often I, I do a, a reflection, I'll just say, you know, bring to mind someone who loves you. And what's it like to feel their love? And I'll ask a person, so what are you noticing? And often they can't answer. Because it's it's conceptual, it's in their mind, but it's not embodied. And many of us, especially if there's an abyss, if we feel cut off, very hard to let in. Let, let's, let's explore for a moment together. It's always best to anchor these things in uh, lived experience, okay? So again, let your attention go inward. And bring to mind someone you know who loves you, who cares about you. And if it's not a living person, that's fine. And if it's a spiritual figure and you have some trust in that, that's fine. But take a moment to let the being be close in, you might see in their eyes the appreciation that's there, the love. What's it like 
to let in love. Check your body, check your heart. What does it feel like? Are you aware of some warmth and some openness of expansion or spaciousness? Or if you're finding that, no, you don't feel anything, to make, let this be a valuable moment of just inquiry. What stops me? And you might ask the, whatever the armoring is, whatever feels like is being blocked, what, what stops you from letting it in? Just as if you're addressing this to some, some bit of armoring, what's stopping you from letting it in? Is it that you don't believe it's possible, or that, that they really don't know who you are? Or that you just don't deserve it? And again, you can keep reflecting, feel free to journal if, if it's helpful to you. The more severed belonging, in other words, the more insecure early attachments, the more trauma from caregivers or society, the more difficult it is to let in, the more armoring. You know, I, I, a couple of weeks ago, was exploring this during my uh, Saturday satsang, and uh, one of the men that I was working with, uh, he was, he's a gay young man, bullied in elementary school, and, you know, deep sense of something's wrong with me, and perhaps it was intensified. He had intersecting identities. He was gay and Latino, no self-compassion. And when, sometimes when there's not a capacity for self-compassion, for offering it to ourselves, I'll say, well, who else do you trust loves you? And he said, my younger sister, absolutely, my mother. And then when we explored that, he couldn't let in their love. And, you know, the, the block was, you know, I don't deserve, there's something really wrong. And when I asked him, well, what does it feel like to be blocked that you can't let in love? He had a real wave of sorrow. And I said, you know, okay, so what, what's there? He goes, there's this longing. And I said, well, go ahead, give, get, let the longing speak. And his prayer was, please, may I let in love. And so I just had him reflect on it. Please, may I let in love over and over. And when he opened his eyes, his eyes were moist, but I could feel the softening. And that's what he named. He, was, he said he, he felt serenity, that, he, that there was, he's on this pathway of opening. So I'm, I'm sharing this with you because we all get stuck in sometimes giving out love, sometimes letting it in. You know, our hearts have been wounded. There's armoring. But what we can do is feel our prayer, feel our prayer to let in. And again, just as I mentioned before, the source of our prayer is our awake heart. It's really love calling us home when we're praying. So when we inhabit that prayer. When I, if I in this moment say, please, please, may I let in love, I become more porous. There's a certain kind of dissolving of the armoring. John O'Donohue said it so well. He said, prayer is the bridge between longing and belonging. It starts allowing us to dissolve. So, This letting in love practice is really, really a powerful, necessary part of loving ourselves into healing. And in the moments that you feel you are letting in some, get familiar with it. Remember Jonathan's word familiar? Get to know it. What's it like when you're really letting in love? And you start strategically where you're least offended, Um, your dog, a child. Um, for me, the natural world, uh, I, 
I know often I'll, I'll when I go to retreats, let's say at the Forest Refuge or the Insight Meditation Society in Barrie, Massachusetts, there's fantastic mature woods there. And when I'm feeling vulnerable and stirred up, I'll often go out into those woods and sometimes lean against a tree and I'll feel this sense of like the great mothers living through that tree and feel really loved and held and protected. And I can kind of cry and feel held by that tree. Um, one friend here brought into our group the, the power of the word, the hug of gravity. And you can kind of sense this natural force of gravity shows us our belonging to this larger body of ours, this earth. So maybe you can let in love by feeling that hug of gravity. Start where it's easiest, and then you can graduate to people (laughs) as you go. Um, There's a a line from uh, another teacher, Punjaji. It's that love is always loving you. And the more you practice letting in love, and it doesn't matter the source, you'll start being able to let in the love of this world, this, the universal loving awareness just will be able, you'll have it wash through more and more and sense that when you're feeling separate and small, that you can have some more access to that sense that love is always loving you. Okay, the last approach I want to look at with you, we've, we've talked about ways to um, just go ahead and practice because it'll get stronger, Um, experiment, really experiment, use your hand, use different words, see what works, letting in love. The last approach I want to mention to really waking up our hearts is opening directly to the suffering of not belonging, to the fear and grief and shame and pain of not belonging. And this is where we often will weave together the mindfulness and compassion of RAIN And and RAIN is not some special technique. It's really the very core techniques of this path. It's mindfulness and compassion in a a weave that makes it easy to follow. Now, in opening directly to the suffering of not belonging, the big remembrance is that especially if there's trauma, because not belonging, feeling separate is what trauma is, if it feels like too much, we spend more time directly nurturing. We don't go right into where it's most painful. First, we need to create the kind of warmth and space that comes from the heart practices. Um, And then when we're ready, we can open to the vulnerability and that vulnerability can become a portal to true belonging. So I just wanna say that again, that if you get any signal of this is too much, I'm gonna be overwhelmed, Go back to what we call resourcing, which means grounding yourself, feeling the hug of gravity, doing the the slow breathing, imagining love pouring into you, something that helps you feel safe, and safe is the key word, and more connected. I want to give you an example of this that came from uh, one woman who gave me permission to share this, a woman of color on the retreat, who was describing uh, last year the horror, the trauma of the murder of George Floyd and how when the video came out, couldn't go near, I mean, just the horror of it. And yet now, this year, she's been listening to every part of the Chauvin trial. He's the one that Uh, lynched George Floyd, every testimony, something inside her told her to go through this process of listening every day, watching every day. She said she owed it to, she feels she owes it to George Floyd to bear witness. And here's what is really um, just so striking, that as the days pass, those first days of the trial last week, she started realizing wow, I can witness and discern this is anger, this is rage, this is fear, this is sorrow, this is empathy. Really hold it in a witnessing presence that had space. 
and and she found this really deep healing in having the capacity to be with. In fact, she described it as gave her a kind of courage and a confidence that was really empowering that she can handle what life brings. We don't get that courage and confidence until we actually open to the vulnerability. But we can't open to the vulnerability unless there's some level of feeling safe enough. So she had intuitively known she was re- knew she was ready to be able to do that. And so I asked her the question, what allowed you to do it? What allowed you to be with this intensity? And she shared the thing that came to mind, which is for the last year or so, she's been participating weekly in a woman's meditation group that was completely rooted in kindness, in metta. And senses that accessing that field of tenderness made it possible that she could bring that field to such pain. It gave her the space. So I'm bringing this in because... um, we need great care and opening to the vulnerable places. And as we do, that's what reveals the openness and the power of loving presence that's really our nature. So I want to close and we'll be, we're going to be doing a bit of a rain meditation addressing the trance of unworthiness. I'm going to name a little bit about RAIN that I found is really helpful for me over the years because I've been, and I still am, working with the ways that that trance appears um, through my life. And so we know that recognize means that when we get some sign that it's here, you might notice it as a thought, a judgmental thought, it may be a sinking feeling, maybe anger, but then we check in and sense, okay, the abyss, I'm cut off from myself. That's recognizing it. Allowing means that we're really able and willing to let it be here. We're not leaving. We're not trying to get rid of it. We're not adding judgment. We're not adding resistance. It may be simply the most we can do is say, okay, I can let this be here for now. Yes to this for the moment. And that that yes can deepen. And if you can get to the point of saying to what's coming up, this belongs. It's, it's waves in the sea. These are part of the waves of my being. That actually deepens the process of freeing up. Each step of rain reduces the identification of a self. The moment you see it, as Jonathan said, if you can name it, you're less identified. The moment you let it be there without resistance, you're even less identified. Now, I want to make a comment on allowing. I was working with someone last week who was judging themselves, and they thought allowing meant saying yes to the judgment, like this uh, part of her that was saying you're failing, that she was saying yes, it's true. Allowing doesn't mean we're saying that the content of the judgment's true. We're just allowing the experience of judging to be there. I hope that's clear because it's a really big difference. And then we investigate. And I find it very useful with the trance of unworthiness to first say, well, what am I believing? And often a person will say, well, you know, I've been rejected before, it's going to happen again. Or I believe I'm failing. And to let that story be a portal. We don't want to stay with the story. But first sense the story of what you're believing about yourself and then come into the body and sense when I'm believing this, what's going on with the felt sense? What am I feeling? Is it sinking or squeeze of shame, fear? I think of it like we're treating the felt sense like a shy animal that lurks in the darkness of the woods and we're inviting it out into the light. And so that's the attitude, a kind of curiosity and a gentleness, inviting the felt sense, inviting what's here. It's like you're saying, I'm here, it's okay. As much as you want, I'm listening. The key of investigating is to get to what I call ouch, a pure place of this hurts. I know for myself, once I really get, okay, I'm strangling my own spirit with these judgments. I'm hurting myself. It's so unnecessary. There's a kind of soul sadness, like I'm grieving the lost moments. 
So we're investigating to get to that place of ouch. We're not saying, oh, I deserve it or oh, others have it worse, but just this hurts. So just explore that. And that will lead to nurturing because we get tenderized. And we've been talking this whole talk about how to nurture, experiment. Experiment with your own wise awake heart offering nurturing, experiment with calling on others. I know for me, when I'm really regressed and feeling separate, I'll often just say, please love me. I'll just feel that prayer, please love me. And that, that brings that porousness. So in some way I'm, I'm reaching out and often what I'll, I'll feel is almost like I'm, I'm reaching out, please love me. I'm kind of bowing, I'm offering my being into something larger. And that just invites a washing through of light and love and tenderness. And then what happens is there's a shift in those moments. And this is what we call after the rain, where once we let in love, we discover we are the love that's holding our life. That small self dissolves and we become the love. So we move from that sense of I'm a small self and love is always loving me to the loving that's holding our being. That's the shift. Srinar Sargadatta says, you can say it simply, nothing is wrong with me anymore. That's a shift to freedom. So let's uh, take a moment to practice this. I'm gonna lead you through a very brief taste which is something many of you are familiar with. Just a brief kind of review with rain, you exploring with yourself. And I invite you to carry it on on your own when you have more time. And you might, as your attention goes inward, feel your body breathing, bring yourself right here. And you've already been reflecting on this some, allowing yourself to bring a situation to mind that brings up self-doubt, self-aversion. Where you feel you create an abyss, in some way you get separate from your inner life. And you might let the lens get a little closer and sense what is it that's really bothers you about the way you are? What is it that really brings up the judgment? What's the worst part about what you perceive about yourself? It really makes you judge or feel aversion or dislike. And the recognizing is just to name mental whisper what you're noticing. It may be aversion or dislike or anger, fear, whatever is most predominant. And with whatever you notice, that allowing, that willingness to let it be here, let the experience be here just for now. And if at any point it feels like too much to really put aside anything I'm saying and go back to the metta that most helps you feel connected. But if you're able to allow, if there is that sense of you can tolerate it, then begin to investigate, what are you believing about yourself? What's the story you're believing that turns you on yourself? Do you feel, are you believing that you're unlovable? That you'll never be close to anyone? 
that you're failing in your life in some way. That you let others down, you cause harm. What, what is it you're believing? And whatever you notice, sense how it affects your life to be turned on yourself. Just let yourself feel in your body what it's like when you're believing something's wrong with you, what's it like? Check your throat, your chest, your belly. And if it helps to put your hand on your heart as a way of accompanying the experience. It can be very powerful to help steady the attention. It's like you're already beginning to self-nurture. You're saying, okay, I'm here. What does this really feel like? And invite the vulnerability forward. What's the worst part of this? You might sense, how long have I been living with this? And most important, how has it affected my life? What has it taken away from me? And since this is the deepest question really, What do I most need to remember? What do I need to trust? Right in this moment, what would bring some healing to know, to trust, to remember? And what might be the source of that message? Who do you want to receive it from? know that just intuitively you know that. You know, is it your high self, your own awake heart? Do you want to hear it from the Buddha or Bodhisattva? Or is there an ancestor, a group of ancestors? Is there a person in your life, a teacher, a friend? It doesn't matter what the source is of who's, who is delivering the message. beginning the nurturing by really sensing. And you can breathe a little more fully, bring yourself right here, that you are receiving exactly the medicine, the heart medicine that can serve you right now, the reminder that can serve you. It might be from your own awake heart. It might be a formless presence as I described a grandparent, an ancestor. And let your intention be to let in. Let that be your prayer. Please may I let in love. And if it's a prayer, you can whisper it a few times and notice each time that you can get more sincere. More receptive. Either please love me or please may I let in love. Perhaps there can be some surrendering open. And with some witnessing right now, just notice the presence that's here. Notice the quality of presence that's emerged. It may be just a little more space, a little more tenderness, maybe it's vast. Maybe you're still really feeling the vulnerability. It doesn't really 
it's not, you can't do it wrong. Just notice what's here. And you might ask yourself, who would you be if you didn't believe something was wrong? As you feel ready to open your eyes and know that this isn't like a a process with a clear beginning and end, but what you can trust is each time, each time you bring your sincerity to making love of yourself more perfect, each time there'll be a little bit of an awakening or a shift from that sense of a small self, the abyss, in some way turned against yourself, to remembering that you are the loving awareness that's holding this life. There'll be some level of shift. Pay attention to that. Get to familiar with it, because it'll really be more and more your home. Okay, friends. I really, really feels really good to be with you all. Um, I thank you for going on the journey in a big way in your life, in this retreat, in this little session here. Blessings. Blessings.